Hello, this is David Ferguson from MLC CAD Systems, and what we're going to be looking at are some of the changes and new features they've added to Mastercam 2021. And the first thing we're going to look at is a simple change they've made to how you can change and modify your approaches in one-way facing routines. Now, what I've got on my screen is just a, a simple block held in a vise, and I want to deck that down. And I've written a, a fairly standard issue facing routine. If I look at the parameters on that, uh, it's a one-way facing routine, and I'm just approaching and exiting the start and end of that cut by about half the cutter width. You know, and if I back plot that, it's 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 pretty standard issue for a facing routine. I'm basically driving down to my depth and then just moving straight into the material. And you know that's fine. Uh, that's certainly applicable in a lot of situations, but it's nice to have options. And one of the new options uh, for your facing routine is the ability to do a roll in. So start each cut with basically an arced pass. And what I've done, I'm still doing a one way pass. It's essentially the same tool path. I've shortened the approach and exit distances, but now I'm gonna use this new roll in function. I'm using a two inch diameter face mill. So I'm just gonna go ahead and just use about half of that for my radial value. And what I end up with using that approach is I get a much nicer start to that pass because my cutter now rolls into that cut. So I'm rolling into the material rather than driving straight into it. Uh, nicer on the insert, you know, better tool life, um, potentially faster feeds and speeds and a, a more efficient chip load. So a small tweak, but a very worthwhile one and uh, you know something pretty excited to see and try out. The next new item we're going to take a look at is a change they've made to the skip pockets function for OptiRefs. Now what I've got on my screen again, same part, uh, stocks removed, we're looking at the part itself, and I've just written a, a fairly standard issue OptiRef that's just using the whole part for drive surfaces, and like you'd expect with an OptiRef, it's just doing everything. You know, it's, it's driving the tool into pretty much every area that it can find based on the drive surfaces. Now, what I'd like to do is I'd like to keep that tool out of those central areas. You know, I don't want the tool path or the tool uh, machining this central area. I'd do that in a different method. And I want to stay for the, you know, for the majority of it out of this area here. Now, the way we used to deal with that or the way you traditionally deal with that is you more than likely go ahead and use a couple of surfaces to plug or cap those areas you want to keep the tool out of, and then you'd select those as drive surfaces, and you'd end up with a tool path that would look like this. You know, I'm staying out of those recessed pocket areas, um, and it's not a bad tool path, but you know, creating those surfaces isn't always so easy. Um, this is a flat boundary surface, and this is a lofted surface, and you know, sometimes it's just difficult to create caps or modify the solid to make that work for you. So what Mastercam's gone ahead and done for 2021 is they've given us the option here on your cut parameters page, I'm sorry, the toolpath control page to skip pockets. And I can go ahead and skip all pockets, so any recessed area, or smaller than a percentile of the tool's diameter. So I've got a, a skip pocket functions turned on in this case here. Haven't changed anything else about my strategy, simply turning on the skip pockets. And I go from a toolpath, if I turn off those plugs, that isn't bad to one that is much nicer. So here's the one without skip small pockets or skip pockets with the plug surfaces. And you can see I'm just sort of glancing across. And if we look at that as a stock model, you can see I've stayed away from those recessed areas, but I haven't really roughed out this area here. Now using the skip pockets function, I can avoid the need to create those surfaces in the first place and I can just have Mastercam just keep the tool out of any recessed areas. And the difference I get with that toolpath based on a generated stock model, uh, I just get a slightly more efficient toolpath. I'm, I'm removing and roughing more material out of this sort of clevest area or this, this area between these two rails, um, whereas before I wasn't. Uh, but I'm still keeping that tool out of you know, any of those recessed down areas. Uh, and again, what's nice about that, it's, it's simply just a switch I'm activating. I'm not having to create any additional geometry to make that work. So it's just a little bit more straightforward than it used to be, and a really nice added feature to OptiRef. Our next feature has to do with some different options they've included uh, for retracts and repositioning moves when writing contours. Um, so what I'm looking at is I've got a really basic contour written to clean off this ear. 
Uh, if we backplot that, it's it's kind of what you would expect from a, a contour that's doing a multi-pass. We're, we're basically just driving that tool, speed it up a little bit, across that surface based on a chain, retracting, moving back, picking up the next pass, a little arc in, a little arc out. It's it's not bad. When I look at this like this, it, it looks like that's going to be okay. But if I check this toolpath in Verify under the backplot function, and I'm in the backplot function, you'll notice something going on there, something I'm not seeing when I'm looking at that toolpath in regular Mastercam. I'm not picking up these dogleg moves. You know, uh, each one of these passes has a little bit of a dogleg going on. So if I back that up and play that, we can see we are doglegging on those rapid moves. Now, I might get away with it here, uh, but obviously if those dog legs were going the other direction, that more than likely is going to violate my part, and that's going to be a bad day for everybody. So there's a couple of new ways to sort of avoid or, or deal with this sort of situation. When I like to keep the tool kind of close on the retracks, but I don't want to run the risk of dog legging or, or zigging, or zagging for that matter, uh, through my part. So one of the first new options they have for contours specifically on the linking parameter page, and this carries over from a lot of the uh, OptiRef functions and the 3D toolpaths, is instead of using a rapid reposition move, I now have the option to treat my reposition moves or my relocation moves as a feed move rather than a rapid. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn on that option uh, to basically use a feed move at my max feed rate for this machine. So I'm just going to feed instead of rapid. As we can see there, it gets rid of the, the rapid lines. If I go ahead and verify that and look at it in backplot, I shouldn't be seeing any of those dog legs. Of course, dog legs typically only happen when you're rapiding. So you can see those dog leg moves, those little zig angular moves on the repositions are gone. And that's that's a nice change. It feels a little bit safer doing it that way. You know, this is something you've definitely, if you've played around with OptiRoughs and some of the surfing stuff, surfacing toolpaths, you've certainly done. You've outputted your repositions as feed moves because generally it just keeps you sort of in a safer position. Now another new option for that, for contours, is this, the arc fit maximum radius callout. What that's going to do, that's going to change, and we'll take a look without it first, uh, these high repositioning, this is another way to get around it, I'm just going to put my, my retracts and repositions at a much higher z value. Um, but that may not necessarily feel the most efficient way to do that. So one of the new ways you can kind of make that just a little bit happier or a little bit nicer is to go ahead and try this new option for for outputting uh, an arc instead of uh, a, basically a straight line move. So I'm going to go ahead and just uh, change my rapid repositions uh, from from basically G1s to some, some arc moves. And I'm just going to put in a, a base value of half an inch and see what that gets me. So with that checked, I'll go ahead and regen that. And you can see I'm now getting really nice sort of arc moves. Now they're a little exaggerated on this. I could bring those, those heights down a little bit to look a little bit nicer or be a little tighter, but you know you can play with it as you want. It's certainly just a nicer way to get that tool to reposition. Just arcing around, you know, feels a little bit efficient, a little smoother, a little safer. And again, I can still, if I don't want rapids, also output all of that movement as a feed rather than a rapid. So with that, I get a toolpath that kind of looks like this. Essentially the same thing, except now I'm feeding everywhere. It's a really nice little addition uh, to your strategies for retracts when you're dealing with a contour, especially if you're in some tight spots and you're you know, looking to keep your tool safe. So outputting is a feed move, putting arcs in there where you couldn't before, really nice, lovely little addition to your contours. All right, this next feature is something I'm incredibly excited about because I do this all the time with spot drills. Um, Mastercam has added a spot drill, or what they're calling a chamfer drill routine, traditionally used with a center drill or a spot drill. And this allows you to put the same size chamfer on holes. Um, no matter what the diameter of the hole is, you're trying to uh, uh, machine. So we'll go ahead and we'll take a look at how this works. Now I've got a, a five axis chamfer drill already written. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to jump into the geometry and I'm just going to wipe the features that I've already selected. So I'm just going to right click in here and just delete all and just reselect some more to show you how this is going to work. So I'm using the solid itself. So I'm just going to come in 
and I'm going to use my my you know feature chain you know chain the inside wall of those making sure I'm just going to pick some of these at random I pick some some here kind of on the side too and then we'll go ahead and we'll grab yeah, that should do we'll grab this one here too okay so a simple sort of five axis drill routine I've got those selected and you notice it's it's grabbing these are all you know different diameters um, you know in the past when you had to do this you basically you're limited to one diameter per tool path so I'm gonna green check this I'm gonna get into the parameters and under my cut parameters basically I can set it either as a, a width value or a depth value in this case we'll just go ahead and we'll put a 15 thou chamfer there ever you know uh, on all those holes I also have a dwell and second function if I want to go ahead and uh, you know leave the tool down for those Everything else on here is pretty much just like every other drilling op. I've selected a tool. I'm using a multi-axis, so I'll leave it in a five-axis routine. Um, you know, my linking parameters I'm still set traditionally. I'm using a, uh, um, you know, if one thing you'll notice, there's no depth value here because the depth is based off the whole feature uh, and the chamfer width you're putting in. Um, I do have a safety zone set up to keep myself um, you know, from running into the part during repositions. But essentially, uh, with that tool path, and we can go ahead and we can back plot this in, regardless of the, the diameter of that hole, my chamfer mill will put a 15 thou, or my spot drill, I should say, will put a 15 thou chamfer on each of those features. So that's a 15 thou, 15 thou. I mean, it, it really does make it remarkably simple uh, to drill a lot of holes or pre-drill or spot drill a lot of holes and put your chamfer in there for taps or, or you know, if it's called out, that sort of thing. Very, very nice. Okay, another new feature Mastercam has for 2021, and it's another drilling uh, toolpath. It's a brand new one. It's called Advanced Drill. And what advanced drill is going to let me do is control what the drill does when it's at certain depths. So it's a good tool path for things in this particular case, uh, like a, a pickle fork or a couple of ears, uh, but also effective if I'm dealing with something like a form drill or a form tap, because I can control the feeds and speeds, um, you know, when the tool is sitting at a particular depth. So for example, on this tool path, what we're going to do is we're going to bring our tool in and essentially we're going to go ahead and peck cycle this first ear and then when I do break through that depth I'm then going to wrap it down and pick up a second peck cycle at another depth so I've got the ability to control what the tool is doing how fast it's spinning um, based on a Z value uh, where I couldn't do that before with drill without either a, some sort of custom macro or something along those lines so let's go ahead and take a look at how this toolpath works. Um, it's chained and selected just like a traditional drilling operation. And for the most part, it is just like a regular drilling op until I get to the cut parameters page, which is different. So what I can do is I can set based off Z depths exactly what I want the tool to be doing. Uh, which spin, which way the direction, you know, which direction the spindle is turning, um, what the RPM is, plus the feed rate, whether I want coolant, do I want to dwell? I can set comments for each of those. Um, and, you know, I can add and and uh, uh, delete segments. I can have really as many as I need to get this done. So, for example, on this first, um, you know, I'm going through the depth of that first section and I'm gonna go ahead and set a feed rate here we'll just put a feed rate of five I haven't put a good feed in there yet uh, the next section right here this is the gap between the bottom of that first year and the start of the next one and I'd like to rapid through that so I'll just put my go ahead and put my feed at zero okay. then I'm picking up the second depth here you know and again you can see I've cranked my spindle back up to 2500 uh, and I'm going through that depth. So I'm going to go ahead and put that feed rate again at, at 5. Uh, and then finally I have my retract back up to 0 with my tool off. So depending on the feature I'm trying to machine or drill, you know, and what I have to break through, I can set different feeds and speeds based entirely off of Z values, um, which is a tremendous flexibility with a single drilling op. Uh, again, especially if you're dealing where parts uh, have gaps, you know, ears, 
uh, form drills, form taps, very, very, very effective uh, new toolpath. I'm very excited to try this out. All right, the next new feature we're gonna look at is in a, an addition or a tweak they've made to your 2D high-speed dynamic mill. And if you're like me, that is certainly one of your favorite toolpaths to rough in Mastercam, uh, but that's not to say it's not without room for improvement. Um, so if we've machined off sort of the front of the part, uh, I've gone ahead and flipped the part over and I've generated a stock model to kind of look and see what I have left. And this is kind of where I'm at with the part. And if I'm flipping the part over, you know, usually the first thing I'm going to be looking to do is deal with what we call from where I'm from, you know, a top hat. I've got this, this large hunk of material left over from the first group of operations, flip the part. I need to get that out of there. And, you know, usually my go-to tool path for doing that would be a 2D high-speed dynamic mill. But 2D high-speed dynamic mill um, does have uh, one issue that you know you generally have to sort of deal with, which is if I'm using an outside strategy, when that tool path starts and starts engaging that material in the corners specifically, it does tend to over engage a little bit. We've all kind of run into that. You know, the tool path from an outside strategy is always sort of pushing into the part. And when it gets to that first corner, you know, my step over generally tends to increase while it's in that corner. Uh, and then I go back to what my normal step over is. So it does tend to sort of over engage uh, when it's rounding those initial corners. And that isn't ideal. I can over engage a tool, I can gall up or load up a tool, break a tool you know, push apart, it's, it's not what I'm looking for. So what they've gone ahead and done uh, for 2021 in the 2D high-speed dynamic, they've gone ahead and add a function under cut parameters called corner pretreatment. And a corner pretreatment function basically allows me to go ahead and do the corners of a machining region either by corner or by depth at a decreased step over, okay? Uh, not only that, I can also have a specific uh, call out for my feeds and speeds um, for just those corner treatments. So I'm just gonna do it really simply. This is just gonna be a climb at about 10% step over just to make sure those corners are okay, all right? Now, I'm gonna go ahead and regenerate this tool path and what I should see here is sort of a, a pre-treatment of that. So I've gone from, from trying to machine off that whole thing to just doing the corners. Now, I can combine those by using the include corners function, which will do the corners first and then machine the rest of that selected area. So as soon as that generates, we'll take a look at that. There we go. So I'm just basically treating those four corners separately. And if we look at that in Verify, you can see really how nice that's gonna look. I'm gonna go ahead and turn off my fixtures. I'll go into Verify and we can look at that machining off that top hat, doing those corners first and then moving into the rest of the material. And this is gonna be, you know, this is something that I've been kind of wanting to see uh, in Dynamic Mill for a while. So very excited that it's there. So I'm maintaining a smaller step over while I machine down those corners. And as soon as I'm done with those corners, I then switch to, you know, my regular step over value. And if I'm using a different feeds and speed for those corners as well, you know, I'm also kicking in a separate feed and speed when I've gone ahead and felt comfortable enough that those corners, you know, are taken care of. And now that the corners are done, I basically just move into the rest of the cut, heavier step over, different feeds and speeds if I want to. Um, it's basically like having two tool paths uh, in one. Okay, the next change or new feature we're going to look at has to do with raster. And I'm kind of a well-known raster junkie. It's one of my favorite tool paths. Um, and they just keep making it better. So what we're doing in this particular case is we're just running a raster over some of these more complex shapes. Uh, you know, as a zigzag, basic raster sort of tool path. And if you're familiar with raster, you know, one of raster's strongest features or elements is the ability to set a machining angle. You know, at zero, you're parallel usually to your x-axis, 90 degrees, you're, you know, parallel to your, your y-axis, anywhere in between there, you can basically determine exactly what angle you want to attack that surface on. Now, 
that's a great feature. But if you're dealing with something that you're not sure where the angle is, you usually have to spend a fair amount of time in uh, analyze or, or, or drawing some geometry and trying to figure out exactly what angle you're looking for. Well, a new feature for 2021 in Mastercam, specifically for raster, is what they're calling the automatic raster angle. And what this looks at, it looks at your drive surfaces and determines sort of what the optimal angle for that toolpath to run at would be. So if I look at this toolpath, it's, it's not bad for a raster, um, but it's not as efficient as it could be because I'm not really attacking lengthwise or along those those features. I'm really sort of just sort of, you know, hitting them a little bit more diagonally than I'd like to. So with the automatic angle function, and I'm going to go ahead and just turn it on right there. It's going to use my drive surfaces. And just to show you what we're using for drive surfaces real quick, there's our drive. So it's going to use those drive surfaces to determine the best angle for that toolpath to run at. So with the automatic turned on, the only change I'm making, I'm going to regenerate it. And now we're following, you know, so those long surfaces. So it's keyed in automatically on what the best a long angle would be. Very, very cool. Um, like I said, they keep making raster better. It's a simple tweak to it, um, but it removes that uh, need for you to spend a lot of time trying to analyze or figure out what the best angle to run that would be at, it's going to try to come up with the solution for you. So I'm usually the guy that makes a mistake when it comes to tool stick out. Um, where a tool can get to, what can I cut with that tool? Uh, I don't have necessarily a good eye for that. Well, in Mastercam 2021, they've come up with a new way sort of just to look at your tool and see, hey, where can this go uh, on this part? What can it get to? So it is based off your, your construction and your tool plane. So I want to look at the bottom of the part. So I'm going to roll my part over. I'm going to check my planes and just I'm going to go ahead and put my C and T planes there on bottom. And then I'm going to go ahead and use the new function up here on my toolpath ribbon all the way on the far right called check tool reach. Extremely cool. So I'm going to fire up check tool reach. Now I've got to select a target body. That's just going to be my solid part itself. But you can use whatever you need to. And then essentially I can manually define that tool or even better, I'm going to use this button here just to select the tool from my library. And I'm going to go ahead and just select, I believe it is tool 15, just a quarter inch isker cutter. And I want to see by hitting the preview button down here, where on this part would that tool be capable of reaching? So I can see the blue areas are the reachable areas and the red areas are unreachable. So based on this plane and this tool, this is everywhere this tool can and cannot reach. Obviously, you know, it's not going to be able to do undercuts or get under anything, but it is letting me know exactly where this is going to be able to go and clear without violating the part. Now, that's awesome. Um, but I can also go ahead, if I've got an assembly, which in this case I do, I've got a tool and a holder, I can also check against the holder itself. So the tool and the holder. So we'll go ahead and re-preview that looking basically at the entire assembly. So this is the tool with my holder and you can see now based on my tool and the amount of stick out I have, it's now showing me based, you know, the blue where it can go, the red where the tool can't reach. And then I've also got a brown color and you can set whatever colors you want for these showing where the tool can't reach based on the amount of stick out or based on a holder violation. So it just gives me a better idea. You know, I can't go any deeper than that brown area. That's as deep as that's going to be able to go. Uh, you know, if I kind of take a look at this area on the side, you can see, you know, based on this angled edge here, it's showing me that this is where that tool could go based on the amount of stick out uh, and holder clearance I would have. Right, the next feature we're going to look at, new feature in Mastercam 2021, uh, and again, this is something to do with contours, and it has to do with how your spring passes can work now. Um, in previous versions of Mastercam, if you're going to do a spring pass along with depth cuts, um, you know, multi-passes, depth cuts, and you want some spring passes in there, you really can only do that spring pass at the final depth. Well, you know, one of the things they've added again to 2021, uh, specifically to contour and on the multi-pass function, is the ability to apply your spring passes to each individual pass. 
specifically to your depth cuts. So, you know, instead of stepping down uh, and then doing the spring pass where you, you might end up on the, you know, off the flute and you're on the shoulder or the shank uh, during that spring pass in some sections, now you can apply a spring pass to each individual pass. So uh, by checking that box right there, just apply spring passes to everything. Um, my tool path now uh, applies a spring pass at each depth cut, which is not something it used to do. So just again, just a little addition, a little bit more uh, flexibility, some more functionality with your contours. Probably decide to keep the tool down. There's my finish pass. And now I should now see a spring pass where I didn't used to be able to do that. All right, one more thing we want to look at with this particular part file. New for Mastercam is my ability to save a part file out as a 3D PDF, uh, which is pretty cool. So if I go up to File and I do a Save As, I have the option of choosing a 3D PDF version. So I'm going to go ahead and save this. And when I go ahead and I look at that in Adobe, this is what you have. This is a 3D PDF. So I can basically, I have complete control and ability to rotate and look at that model. Um, all I need is Adobe to look at this. Uh, I've got some different plane views I can look. So, you know, uh, for, for sharing part files, for collaborations, for, for setup sheets, um, very, very, very useful. Okay, changing gears a little bit for our next new feature. Uh, Mastercam 2021 now supports solid work holding components in mill turn. So what we're going to do is we're going to add uh, a 10 inch six jawed chuck and then a collet chuck uh, to an existing mill turn machine. Now I've opened up Code Expert and I've opened up my machine file and this is a Mazak Integrax i100. And what I would traditionally do in this case is I would go ahead in the machine explorer, I would right click and I would open up the metric component library which in Mastercam will drop me right into the component library function. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna be adding a additional chuck group and an additional jaw group. And we'll be using existing solid models that I've imported from a manufacturer. So the first part of this is to go ahead and add the chuck itself. So I'm gonna right click and create a new chuck on the chuck group. So I'm just gonna add a chuck there. And we'll go ahead and we'll give it a better name. I'm going to go ahead and call this my, my 10 inch six jaw. And for the geometry here, I'm going to go ahead and select a solid entity. And I'm just going to go ahead and go to the file. And there's the model of my 10 inch jaw. So I'll just go ahead and bring that in as a step. And there we go. And what I'm being asked to do at this point is go ahead and select the, the element that I'm trying to import. In this case, I'm just going to go ahead and click on the body of the jaw itself. And then I need to go ahead and select what they would call a connection uh, plane or a machine connection plane. That means I'm basically going to click on the back of this to give it an orientation. Uh, and that gives me a Z and an X orientation for that component. And that looks good to me. So I'm going to go ahead and green check that. And that gets me back in here. Now, what you'll notice, uh, I can do a couple of things. I'm going to go over to the parameters function here. And I can change certain things like my minimum speed or maximum spindle speed. So we'll go ahead and set that at 25. Uh, we'll go ahead mounting jaw position, jaw mounting position on the chuck face. And then I'll go ahead and check the geometry here one more time. Number of jaws would be six. So we're just increasing that. But you notice it's picked up channel width, channel depth, thickness, and the basic parameters for that. So that should be okay for my jaw. So I'll go ahead and green check to accept that. And there's my 10 inch jaw. I'm gonna go ahead and add the, or it says, sorry, 10 inch chuck itself, the chuck base. I'm gonna go ahead and add the jaws next. I'm gonna right click on the jaw group and I'm just gonna add those chuck jaws. Again, I'm gonna do that using a solid model and it's the same solid entity that I was using before. So I'll just go back to that file. There it is. And this time what I'll do is I'll select one of the jaws to use from there. So as soon as that loads up, there we go. And I'll just go ahead and grab this one right there. That should work for me. Now I do need to do some orientation there. So I'll select the jaw face. 
So in that case, the jaw face on this, I'm going to go ahead and click here to give it a basic orientation. And then I do need to rotate this just because the one I selected, uh, negative 90 there. So we'll just go ahead and bring that guy, that basic orientation down to negative 90. We'll just type that in. There we go. That gives me the orientation I'm looking for. Now I'll go ahead and I'm going to right click, look at that in my top view and see if that's about where I want that. It's lined up where I need it. So I'll go ahead and green check to get back to my dialog. Uh, I want to make sure I'm using a spin profile on that, not a slice. And then under the parameters, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and put in a user defined position there, 3.5 millimeters, it is metric. And I'm going to go ahead and select a reference point on the chuck, and that looks about where I want it, right there and there. So I'll go ahead and hit enter again. I do want to give it a better name than just chuck jaws, so I'm just going to say jaws 6, so I can find it easily again. Uh, once I've done that, I'm going to green check out of there. I'm going to make sure I hit save. I've added the, the jaw base or the, the chuck base and the jaws itself. I'm going to go ahead and hit save. Make sure I go ahead and allow the backup and then green check out. Okay, to add the collet, very similar workflow and process to adding the chuck. So again, I've got my, my GMD, my components library open. And I'm going to go ahead and add my chuck group, my collet chuck group, and my collet group here. And basically using, again, just imported solid models. So I'm going to right click and add a collet chuck. And same basic interface as with the chuck itself. So uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and choose that from a solid entity. I'll use my file explorer. There's the collet model I want to use. Here we go. And we'll just import that in. And I need to select the collet portion or the, the chuck, call it chuck portion. So I'll go ahead and select that. And then again, I need to select that machine connection face. So we'll select the back face here to get it oriented. And that looks to be about where I'd want that to be. So I'm going to green check to get back into the dialog. Uh, and again, I have the same things. I can add a, a minimum spindle speed to that. So we'll do that at say six or maximum spindle speed. So we'll leave that at 6,500. Um, but for the most part, uh, allowing through stock, if I've got a bar feed, uh, these parameters are dropping in good. So I feel okay to go ahead and green check out. So that looks all right. Now we'll do the call it portion next. So I'll right click on the call it group and I'll add the call it. It'll again be the same model. So again, solid entity. Use my file explorer and grab that piece. But of course, this time I've, I've got to make sure I'm only selecting just the call it portion of my model. And I've got to select that machine connection plane. Okay, so aligning that, I'm gonna pick this edge here to align. Um, I believe I need to go opposite. There we go, that's what I'm looking for. So I'll go ahead and then green check. And then I'll go ahead and green check out of there. I'm going to make sure I hit save on my components. And then I'll green check one more time out. Now, to use those new solid components uh, in your mill turn environment, basically you just have to add them in your job setup. So I've opened up that Mazak Integrax and I'm going to go into my job setup. And I'm going to go ahead and change my left spindle, which is still using that default six inch chuck. Uh, I want to switch to that 10 inch chuck we created. So I'm going to right click in my machine configuration now that I've added that. And I'm basically just going to select a new chuck. And I should see that 10 inch chuck listed. And there it is. There's the 10 by 6 jaw. So I'll go ahead and select that. That puts it right there. I can preview that if I want to. But that looks okay. Now I should, when I green check, See that update, and that does look like we have switched to our 10 inch six jaw chuck. So very simple, just a matter of selecting the component you wanna use when you're doing the job setup, as long as it's been added correctly. All right, now that I've added my chuck and my call it chuck to my machine environment, I wanna go ahead and look at that and see how that looks like in my machine sim. So we're jumping ahead a little bit. I've already got some tool paths written. I've got the machine loaded with those elements. I'm gonna go ahead and select all my operations hit my G1 button and get into my machine simulation and just see if things are lining up the way we expect them to. So code expert will load my sync manager. And you can see I'm actually seeing the jaws 
the new Chuck and the new Jaws and the Call It Chuck already here, but we'll go ahead and we'll fire up the full sim just to go ahead and see it. So I'll launch my machine sim. And there's our nice Integrex. We'll, we'll, we'll turn some stuff off here. I'll turn off the machine housing so we can kind of see. And there we go. Those new added elements, not only working when I'm programming the part, but showing up nicely in the sync manager and the machine simulation. All right, last thing I wanna look at uh, in our first section here is a new threading toolpath uh, for lathe, what they're calling the custom thread routine. So we'll take a quick look at what that's about. So I've already got one written. We'll look at the parameters for it. I'm gonna go ahead and open up the parameters for that. And what you'll, you'll find interesting, uh, and this is certainly new for us, is this toolpath uses Mastercam's new panel style of layout. So it actually opens up in the left-hand side like a manager. If you've used the uh, the 3D tool uh, designer or 3D tool creator, um, you've already a little familiar with this layout, but it's, it's still a relatively new layout for Mastercam. So we've got our tool here, uh, number, offset, number. Um, I've got the axis combination I'm going to use, the plane I'm using, uh, any tool angle thing, any tool angles, orientation on machine, what quadrant I'm comping to, um, some approach and reference retract points if I want to use that, the ability to put a comment in there, and then I get down to the actual thread shape. Um, so uh, parametric or chain, I'm going to use parametric on this one. And I've got some basic ideas as far as ropes, buttress, squares, trapezoidal threads. We'll use a rope thread, um, major, minor diameter, uh, pitch, uh, whether it has a flat bottom or there's uh, any rads to the thread, basically defines the thread shape. I can preview that general thread shape by hitting the preview button. And that gives me an idea of the, the shape of that toolpath. Uh, the red line is the shape of the thread. The green box is actually the area of the thread, so the start and stop points plus the overall depth of the thread. Uh, it's going to show me that. Um, I've got basic moves as far as uh, my rough motion, how many steps do I want, the amount of steps, step over if I'm using a round tool. You're typically using this with a form style tool. Cut direction, stock to leave functions uh, for the rough. So just like a normal typical toolpath, feeds and speeds. I've got my finish pass, uh, number of passes I want, feeds and speeds, the style or strategy I want to use. You've got some options, positive, negative, bi-directional, alternating, uh, one of the all-time greats. Um, I've got basic motion control as far as clearance. Uh, this is where I set my start and end position of the thread. Um, some advanced motion control uh, as far as you know, thread pitch, number of thread starts if I need them. Um, the amount of stock I'm leaving, stock clearance, and just some general setting functions. So that is kind of the new layout for this toolpath and something we're, we're going to get used to. Um, so let's go ahead and let's take a look at this thread, this toolpath cutting. Uh, now I am doing a, a dynamic rough to do a little bit of relief there, but we'll just take a look at this and verify with true thread turned on. And there's my form tool. I'm going to turn this up pretty quick. Uh, as you know, TrueThread does tend to run a little bit slower, so I'm going to put this on its max step, and we'll just let this step through. So there's my relief channel, and then I'm basically using that custom thread form to go ahead and, in this case, make a rope thread. Um, so rope, buttresses, trapezoidal, square, um, anything that you sort of thread that you're not using a traditional threading tool, custom thread can get you there. Um, very cool new toolpath in Mastercam. Really looking forward to trying this out with some of our customers. Here are some changes they've made to the solid chaining selections, and they've made it really, really easy to do certain things. So what I've got on my screen is I've just got a part, and there's an area that I am very much wanting to machine, which is this little flat shelf down here. So first thing I'm going to do is just I've already got a plane created for that. I'm just going to try to remember where that plane is. There it is. I'm just going to move my WCS over there and turn off those axis lines. And then I'm going to go ahead and write a, a simple 2D high speed dynamic uh, using only the solid uh, to chain for these open areas. So I'm going to go up to my toolpaths, grab a 2D high speed dynamic mill. It'll be an inside strategy. And for my machining region, uh, I've got a couple choices. You know, I could use a face, but one of the things I do want to show you right out of the box is a change they've made to loop. Uh, traditionally, when you do a loop, and I'm just going to go ahead and set it for loop and look over. I'm going to click on that edge. 
uh, I'm no longer required to select or confirm the face that I'm selecting. Uh, it does a better job of assuming the face you're looping around from the beginning. So I no longer have that additional dialog to click through. So there's my loop. And if I preview change that, uh, you can see I'm staying right inside that area, which is okay, but not quite what I want. What I also want to do is go ahead and make sure I chain these two open areas. So for air regions, I'm going to go ahead and use an option down here called outer open edges. And I'm going to go ahead and select outer open edges. I'm going to click on this face again, and it's only going to select the edges of that solid face that are considered open. Uh, even though they do share a face with these rads, those are technically considered open. And you notice it is not getting the other faces with the other rads that are technically not open. So it only grabs those open faces or those open edges of that face. Very, very quick. I'm going to go ahead and hit my preview chains on that. And you can see I've really, you know, very quickly denoted uh, those two air regions. So I'm going to go ahead and green check to get into the toolpath itself. And we'll just keep this kind of simple. So I'll just go ahead and grab a half inch bull nose. I'll go down to my cut parameters. Uh, I'll drop my step over down a little bit to something a little more realistic. And I'll drop the stock off the walls just for that. Uh, I'm going to go down to my linking parameters and just set these all for incremental. I'm not going to do anything fancy or weird here, just incremental. But I will, as always with dynamic, just do a quick arc filter to keep the code down. And I'll go ahead and I'll green check. And you can see very, very quickly, I get a really nice tricordial tool path uh, that picks up my machining region, uh, stays inside. Uh, but just by clicking on that face, I can you know, let it know where those air regions are and get a nice, clean, simple tool path. All right. Now, continuing with the solid chains, I want to go ahead and I want to finish these little areas here, this edge here and this edge here. I just want to run a contour across that. So I'm going to grab a contour and I'm still going to be in solid chaining, but this time I'm going to use what they call outer shared edges. So these would be the two edges with the rads going sort of positive, not falling away from the surface. I'm just going to go ahead and click on that face again, and you can see it picks up those two shared outer edges. So I'll green check that. I'm in a contour, so I'll just I'll grab the same tool, and you know it's just a contour. I'm not going to do anything really fancy here. That's fine. Leading lead outs. We'll leave those stock. You know, no multi paths. It's all about the chaining. I'll just set these for incremental, and I'll just leave it default, and we'll see what we end up with. And those lead-in lead-outs are a little exaggerated. We can shorten those up. But, you know, with just by clicking on that face and knowing the edges I'm after, I can get that tool coming in and tracking those two edges uh, simply by selecting the face that they're on. Um, very, very quick, very, very simple. I just need to fix my lead-in lead-out so they're, you know, not that. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, the next item we're going to look at are some significant changes that Mastercam has made to the bounding box tool. Uh, bounding box has been around forever. Uh, and if you're like me, you use it uh, for lots of different things. And some of the enhancements they've made are gonna just make it that much more flexible for you. So uh, I'm just gonna create a standard bounding box here. I'm gonna go ahead and put this in my top view. Uh, that's the best way we can see this. I'm gonna go to my wireframe and I'm gonna grab a bounding box, select the part. You guys know the drill about this. And I'm looking at a fairly standard issue bounding box there. You know, it's 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 uh, aligned to my uh, construction plane, so it's you know the edges are parallel to X and Y and Z, um, and it's okay. It, it's not bad. That would certainly get me going. Um, there are some new functionalities though that can make this a little bit more efficient, at least as far as the space you're using. Uh, the first one, down here on the bottom, instead of using a construction plane alignment, I'm going to choose an auto alignment, which will actually use the solid itself to just twist or find the most efficient coverage of that part with that box. So you can see the difference again between using a construction plane alignment and an auto alignment. You know, better use of material. Um, really, really nice. Very, very simple. Um, I might have to realign my part after doing this, but you know, that's fine. I'm okay with that. Might have to align my planes, but that's all good. Now, another function that they've come up with is something they're calling wrap. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and leave it on construction plane, at least at the moment. I'm going to go ahead and put it on wrap. And what that's going to do is wrap. I need to 
set it for what they call a minimum volume, it's going to wrap the solid um, essentially in cellophane, if you want to think about it. It's just been shrink wrapped. Uh, if I create this, it will create this as a, uh, a mesh solid. So it'll be a solid that I can use for stock uh, or for anything else. So, you know, it will create that solid. Very, very nice. Um, nice if you're working from castings or you're getting a part that's, you know, uh, you know, a little oddly shaped. Very useful. Um, there's a twist on this that I really like, which is the, the minimum volume setting is, is nice. You can additionally offset it there, so you can puff that out if you want to. Um, but actually, the wrap setting using what they call a silhouette boundary, uh, it doesn't do the 3D wrap. It's more of a 2D wrap. And what that's going to do with a silhouette boundary is come up with essentially a, you know, a, a plug or a, a piece of stock that is uh, on the outer edges covering your part, but still flat on the top and bottom. So it doesn't do that, that full wrap effect. It really just wraps it to sort of the XY boundary, uh, much like a silhouette boundary does. Um, so we've got an auto, sec, uh, an auto function, the wrap function, either as a full shrink wrap part or as a silhouette boundary wrap, uh, all of which you can output as either a solid model um, or a polygonal mesh uh, to use for your stock and setup. So very, very cool new additions to Bounding Box. Okay, so what we're gonna look at now are some changes they've made to the step over calculation uh, for some of the multi-axis tool paths. And we're gonna try this out with a parallel. Um, so I've got my model on my screen again. I'm not actually gonna turn that off for a moment so we can just focus in on these drive surfaces down here. And we're gonna go ahead and write a, just a simple parallel and play with some of the options here. So I'm gonna jump up to my multi-axis gallery. Don't grab the 3D parallel. <laughs> grab my multi-axis parallel. Uh, I'm just gonna use a lollipop on this. It's my only real tool I have for this at the moment. Then I'm gonna go down to my cut pattern and we'll go ahead and we'll just do this on a simple curve. And I'm just gonna go ahead and select this curve, 3D mode, wireframe. I'm just gonna select that curve right there. And then for the drive surface, just to play with this to start, I'm just gonna pick these two surfaces here. All right. Now, uh, other changes I want to make, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, do a full cut to the edge of those surfaces. Step over, not really concerned about so much. It's at 50. Um, that's fine for what we're doing. Um, I'm not really going to make any other changes. I just kind of want to see what this toolpath looks like. So a curve, uh, two drive surfaces, full and start, 50,000 step over with a parallel. and We'll see what we end up getting. And that's not a bad toolpath. That, that's following that surface reasonably well. But as I look closer, I do notice that as the tool starts to work across that surface, it's really more following the edge of the surface here than adhering you know, to my drive curves or my, uh, my curve selection. Um, and it's washing out, not so much, the step over looks good, but it, it's not as smooth as I'd like it to be. So I'm gonna use one of the first options in here, which is the extend edge curve option, which is on the cut parameter page. So I'll go back into my parameters and I'm going to go ahead, I'm sorry, it's on the, um, there we go, parameters for surface edge handling. Uh, they keep moving stuff around sometimes. Uh, and it's this guy right here, extend edge curve. And what that's going to do essentially is extend my drive curve here um, and maintain that angle and that curve across the surface regardless of where that surface edge is going. So we'll regenerate that and we'll kind of see that immediately. That is a much straighter, tighter looking toolpath following this curve and not really uh, arcing or, or, or wandering off because of where the surface edges are going. So real simple adjustment to that. Now, you can get yourself in a little bit of a trouble with this. So I'll show you what happens. We're gonna go ahead and select um, the rest of the drive surfaces. So I'm gonna go back to my cut pattern and I'm just gonna add those additional surfaces in. And then without making any other adjustments, I'll go ahead and regenerate that tool path. And we, you know, get a bit of a mess. Um, what's happening is the way Mastercam is calculating the step overs as it's rounding those edges. It's doing what's referred to as an approximate step over calculation. So it's actually using the drive surfaces to sort of average out a step over. Uh, as you can see, I've got some significant washout uh, especially there at the end. I mean, that's just terrible. Wouldn't want to do that. Uh, so there's a way to combat this. 
Uh, and that is again in my cut parameters, I'm gonna go ahead and change the way Mastercam is calculating my step overs. I'm gonna go to, again, the advanced options for surface quality. And instead of using uh, an approximate step over calculation, I'm gonna go ahead and use an exact method, which uses a, a hard value, step over value for that. So we'll change it to exact, I'll we'll regenerate that. And I'm not getting that wash out anymore. I'm getting my constant 50,000 step over all the way across those drive surfaces, no more dead spots or blank, blank zones, you know, it, no washout, much smoother, much nicer. All right, for our next example, we're gonna go ahead and look at a change Mastercam has made to the extend edge curve function for your morph tool path. So we're looking at a computer mold core here, and I wanna go ahead and run a morph uh, along some of these outside edges here, these outside faces. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn on uh, some edge curves I've created just to sort of demonstrate this. And I will grab my morph tool path from my multi-axis gallery. And we'll go ahead and we'll just grab just a 10 millimeter ball nose. I'll go down to my cut pattern and we'll go ahead and run this off a couple of from and to curves. That'll be my from curve and then my to curve. And then I'll go ahead and select my drive surface. Now I'm gonna go ahead and change a couple things. I'm gonna go ahead and do a full start and end at exact surfaces, edges. Uh, Step overs at one millimeter, that's plenty fine here. Um, but I'm not gonna use the extend trim functions quite yet, because we wanna see what this looks like initially. I will go down to my tool axis control, and I'll do five axis, surface width tilt, and I'll just do a side tilt of about 80 degrees or so. Fairly standard issue stuff. And no collision control yet. So we'll generate that tool path, and it's not gonna be a, a bad tool path, but you know, because of the shape and length of those edge curves, down on the bottom, uh, the morph is, is very much losing the plot. It's just sort of getting lost down there. So what we'll do is we'll go back to the parameters for that morph and we'll try using that basic ex, you know, extend edge curve. So on my cut pattern, sorry, on the, um, there we go, parameters for surface edge handling, extend edge curve. We, we've already tried that on the parallel. Let's see what it does on a morph. I'll regenerate it. And that's looking better, but again, it's sort of losing that plot down there on the bottom. So what I'd like to try to do is use some of the more advanced options. Under cut pattern, I'm gonna use the extend trim function. That's what I'm looking for, right there. That gives me an additional field here for extend and trim. And we'll go ahead and I'll do either a percentage of the tool diameter or a hard value. I'm a big fan of hard values, so I'm gonna go ahead and extend these by about, say, 15 millimeter. Okay. And again, that's all I'm changing there. Green check, I'll regenerate. And we're getting a better looking tool path. It looks a little bit nicer. Now, I do wanna see one thing. If I uncheck the option for edge curves, extending them, but I leave my extend trim on. Yeah, again, kind of messy. So it's not bad. Of course, the only problem I'm having there is that the tool is violating you know, these surfaces here. So I do want to fix that with a couple of check surfaces to keep that thing under control. So I'll go down to my collision control and I'm going to go ahead and turn on some checks. And to show you what I'm using for checks, Basically, we're just going to keep the tool out of there. So stay, yep, stock to leave, checks, everything. That should be okay. Select the flute. And now I'm getting a really nice morph extended past those outer edges uh, without violating those parts or violating those surfaces. So we'll try the same thing on the bottom. And just to show you how it works in sort of this situation. So again, I'll do a morph. So same tool path, uh, same tool. And again, we'll do a to and from. So there's my from selection and my pattern two, much shorter piece of geometry there, uh, plus my drive surface. Now I'm gonna turn off the extensions that were on earlier, because of course Mastercam is carrying those over for me. We'll just take a look at it 
in its raw form. And I'm going to turn off those checks here. I don't need those here. And as you can see, you know, it's driving between those two curves, but of course this curve being much shorter, uh, we're not getting a very, very clean pattern and certainly nothing I'd want to run. So in this particular case, I'm just going to try the extend edge curve option to just default to this longer piece of wireframe. And there we go. Much nicer looking toolpath. Um, and then again, if I want to extend the edges out a little bit under my cut pattern, I can do extend trim and I'll just use the same ones as last time, just a 15 millimeter extension. It's basically a tangential extension over the, out of the, over the end of that edge. And we've just extended that that little bit. Okay, for our next example, we're going to go ahead and we're going to take a look at some changes they've made to your ability to edit and manipulate your solid chains. So again, we're still in this computer mold and, and we're just gonna play around with it a little bit with a couple of contours chained with the solid. So I'm gonna jump into my contour. I'm gonna put myself on solid chaining and I'm just gonna go ahead and go for edges in this particular case to start with. And I'm just gonna sort of work my way around these bottom edges here. Just chaining single edges like that. Uh, and then I'm gonna go ahead and switch to to outer, outer shared edges. So I'll switch to outer shared edges. I'm gonna go ahead and go for these pockets. And again, that's only choosing those edges of that surface that are shared with another surface. So I'll select that and I'll come over and I'll grab this pocket as well. And there we go. Now I'll just use a simple tool on this. I'll just use a 12 millimeter bull nose. My cut parameters, just comping to the left, no stock to leave, lead in, lead out, should be okay. The only thing I'll do is I'll drop the sweep on the exit, or oh, that's on the entrance, sorry, on the exit. We'll just go straight out. And then for linking parameters, I'll just go ahead and just set everything for incremental, and we'll see what we get. So as you can see, I'm getting a, a fairly straightforward, you know, group of contours, but I've forgotten something. And unfortunately what I've forgotten is that I'm holding my part down with a couple of strap clamps. And so now several of my contours are problematic. Uh, this one is obviously violating the clamp. Uh, this one is violating the clamp. This interior pocket feature violating the clamp. So, you know, usually when you see something like this, you're going to dump everything and start over. But in Mastercam 2021, I have a new option. If I go to edit chains, I have this function here, display all selection arrows. If I hit this button, that's going to show me all the chains in that particular group or for that particular toolpath. And then what I can do is I can start using some of these buttons by selecting the chain, selecting the arrow. I can then delete it, edit it, or new for solids. We'll go ahead and start with this one right here. I can adjust its start point dynamically, which I've never been able to do before. So I'm going to click on that green arrow, the chain I've selected. I'm just going to slide that till I'm happy like that. Then I'm going to go ahead and hit the display all selection arrows again. I'm going to come over to this side. I'm going to select this arrow for this chain, hit dynamic again, and just slide that till I'm pleased with it. Now, I have this clamp here, but, or this clamp and this chain here, but unfortunately the dynamic doesn't really work great when you've got a curve. See, it keeps kind of defaulting back to that there. So what I would do in this case, is I would select this chain just by clicking on it. And I go ahead and delete it. Then I'm just simply gonna rechain it as a partial. So starting there and ending there. Then I can go ahead and choose the edit dynamic and adjust that start point so I'm clearing that clamp. What's nice about this interface is I can edit and you know modify multiple chains 
uh, without having to constantly go back to the chain manager and select the chain and edit simply by just clicking on the chain I want to edit or delete. So with those changes made, I'll green check, green check again, and I'll regenerate. And I've adjusted those start points to clear, hopefully, uh, those strap clamps that I had forgotten about without having to dump my tool path or start over or get rid of all my chains and start those over. I'm just going to edit the chains I have. So very excited about that. What we're going to look at next are some general enhancements they've made to our high speed surfacing tool paths. So I've got a part of my screen. I'm going to go ahead and zoom in. I'm interested in machining or finishing this shaded surface just using a traditional scallop tool path. And I'm going to show you how much these new enhancements can, can change what you can do with just a simple scallop. So we'll start by writing just a simple baseline scallop tool path. So I'll grab an equal scallop. Uh, for my machining region, I'll just go ahead and select those three areas there. And we won't leave any stock on those guys. And I'll go ahead and add some avoidance in there. And I'll just do a quick shift click to grab some avoidance. That'll keep the tool off of there. I will go down to my toolpath control and I'll add a little bit of projected smoothing to start and we'll stick with closed offsets and tooltip to center containment should work okay for what we're doing. I'll grab my tool, just a four millimeter ball nose, and then I'll go down to my cut parameters and we'll do a one way uh, step over about one millimeter and I'll go ahead and choose to keep the tool down at 100%. And just double checking the rest. All right, we'll green check that. And what we're expecting to see, once it generates, is a pretty traditional scallop tool path. And that's what I'm looking at. If I zoom in, this is every scallop I've ever written. Um, and it's not bad, it's fine. Uh, but we can play with this a lot. And we can make this a very, very different animal with a couple of tweaks. So the first thing I wanna do is go ahead and look at these transitions. I've got that, that traditional sort of just lazy move over the surface for the next pass. So if I go down to my linking parameters, I'm gonna do a couple of things. Number one, I'm gonna zero out all of my horizontal moves just to start. I don't want any horizontal moves. I'm just leaving the vertical stuff on there. And then I'm gonna use this button down here called apply transitions. Now what this is gonna do is this is gonna apply my leads or my spaghetti numbers uh, to every transition. So let's just take a look and see what that's gonna look like. So I should expect to see some actual movement away from the part uh, while I move between each passes. So apply transitions. And we'll go ahead and regenerate that and see what we end up with. And there you can see instead of moving across the surface, I'm actually using my leads to move between each pass. Now that may not be the most efficient way to do that. Let's start playing a little bit more. Uh, I'll go back into the parameters and on my transitions angle, I'm actually gonna drop these to zero. And that's gonna sort of line those guys up a little nicer for me. You can see I've got a nice arc out and arc back in, not, not sort of moving across the surface to pick up a new pass. Now I want to continue messing with this a little bit. So I'm going to go back into my parameters. I'm going to go back up to my toolpath control specifically, and I'm going to go ahead and switch over to a trimmed offset. And then I'm also going to go ahead and add a curve to better flow that toolpath. So I'm going to go down to my curve function, select that. Beyond solid, I'll just simply go for edges and I'll zoom in a little bit. I'll grab that and just bounce that guy along that bottom edge there. Okay. All right, then I'm gonna to go to my cut parameters and since this is now a technically an open contour, I'm gonna change my open contour direction to a zigzag. We'll go ahead and apply that, regenerate it, and we'll take a look at what we get. That is a much nicer looking tool path. We went from a traditional scallop with a couple of tweaks to something that is very much not a traditional scallop. Uh, very, very powerful little, little tweaks they've made there. Okay, we're gonna do the similar thing this time, but we're gonna try it with a raster, uh, one of my favorite toolpaths. So I'm gonna come up, I'm gonna grab a raster, and for my machining geometry, I'm just gonna go ahead and select this face right there, and we'll zero out that stock. 
I'll go down to my toolpath control. I'll go ahead and include a silhouette boundary. Again, tooltip center, that should be fine. We'll go ahead and use the same tool there. Uh, down to my cut parameters, I'll go ahead and put my step over again at about one millimeter. Keep tool down 100%. And it's a raster, so we'll be zigzagging. And I'll leave it on the custom to just go ahead and uh, just do parallel tacks. That should be fine. Uh, on my linking parameters, again, I'm going to go ahead and do a, a simple extension by about five millimeters there. Uh, again, I'm going to zero out my horizontals. And we'll go ahead and apply that to every transition move. And we'll see what we get with this. So we can see I've got a really lovely extension of that tool path past those outer edges. That looks really nice, but eh, I'm probably extending a little bit too much. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go back into my parameters and rather than chase this number here, I'm just going to go ahead and add a couple of check or avoidance surfaces here just to keep that tool path under control. And we'll keep it off the floor stock by say about three millimeters and we'll See if that trims it up for us. So again, regenerating it. And there we go, really nice. So that ability to apply my leads as transitions, extremely useful, very, very cool. Okay, this next example, we're gonna look at a multi-axis parallel tool path when I'm using an oval form or a barrel shaped tool. Uh, if you've played with those tools, you know they, they're very, uh, very efficient, but they can be a little hard to control when you get sort of towards the bottom of pockets or bottom of surfaces. Um, sometimes they don't make great contact. So we'll look at a couple of things that Mastercam has done to sort of address that. Um, so I've got a part here. I'm going to focus on this sort of shaded pocket area. And basically, I'm going to write a parallel to finish those walls. So I'm going to jump up, grab a multi-axis parallel. I'm using an eight millimeter oval form tool. And we want to see what that tool looks like. You know, it's the more modern barrel or oval shaped for accelerated finishing. So that's what we're going to use. Uh, for my cut pattern, I am going to choose to use an angle and a constant Z angle. And for my drive surfaces here, I'm just going to go ahead and shift click those walls. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and put my step over down here, say at about five. And under tool axis control, we'll be using uh, surface with tilt. And knowing these tools, I need about 80 degrees. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and write this tool path right now and just kind of take a look and see what it's gonna do. And it looks like a fairly standard issue parallel. Um, if I back plot this and start running through that, what we'll notice though, as I kind of skip through, as we get towards the bottom, it's gonna to start to lose the plot a little bit with keeping that tool in contact. Let me slow it down a little bit. We can see if you can see what I'm talking about. So as we're down sort of towards the bottom of that, we're not really making great contact with that wall. I realize it's hard to see there, but we're not really there. We're, we're coming off that surface a little bit just by the nature of the angle of the tool. Hard to see, but it's not great. All right, so to address that, what I'm gonna go ahead and do is in my parameters, I'm going to go ahead and use some collision control. And I'm going to go ahead and tell it, you know, what I'd like you to do is tilt that tool using my tilt angle against a check surface. I'll go ahead and select that down there on the bottom as my check. And what that's going to do is sort of suck that tool up against that check surface a little bit. And you can already see it. I'm getting an additional pass down there on the bottom. If I go ahead and I back plot that and we'll Kind of skip the end and back up a little bit. Speed that along there. So we get down to that bottom. Our tool is making much nicer contact with that surface. So being able to drive that to a check helps with your accelerated finishing routines. So very nice little tweak, um, but uh, with the way these tools are sort of coming on, it's definitely one that's gonna get a lot of usage.
All right, now I'm going to recreate that style of parallel using one of the new toolpaths, and that is multi-axis pocketing right there, which used to, I think, be called multi-axis rough, uh, but multi-axis pocketing. It's a new one. And go ahead and fire it up, and I'm going to use the same tool. I'm going to use my 8 millimeter oval shape. And under cut pattern, uh, I've got a lot of choices here. Actually, make sure the stock is shut down for this. Machining, pattern machining, I'm going to go ahead and choose wall finishing. And then I'm going to go ahead and select the floor surface and selection and the wall surface. And I'll just shift click to select my walls. There we go. Now I'm going to put my step over again about five millimeters so it's nice and easy to see. And our strategy is going to be a parallel. And the guide curve will be the floor curve. And we'll just do it as a one way. Now. I'm going to go to my tool axis control and my minimum contact point here, cutting length, I'm going to drop this from 40 down to about 5 just to get the tip of that tool a little bit closer. Uh, collision control, linking, all good. So I'll go ahead and green check and we'll take a look at this toolpath. Very quick, very easy to write. And there's our morph. Well, sorry, there's our parallel as a pocket. And we can go ahead and we can take a look at what this is doing. So similar to the other toolpath we were writing, um, just a little, little faster out of the box with it. And if you notice, this one is also on the bottom, very nicely getting that tool down into that area. So they've really made effort, a lot of effort, to make these oval form and these accelerated finishing toolpaths just quicker to write um, and a little bit more intuitive out of the box. So you're not fighting it as much as, as you might be on previous releases. Okay, for our next example, what we're gonna take a look at is Mastercam now has the ability to edit your UV curves uh, for toolpaths like flow lines or five axis flow. So what I'm gonna do, I've got a solid here. I'm gonna actually turn on some surfaces I've created and we can go ahead and look at these surfaces. I'm gonna look at this in a, in a couple of ways. Um, on my surface menu now, I now have edit and reflow UVs. And we'll look at the edit function first and then we'll look at reflow. So I'm gonna hit edit UV and I'm gonna select the surfaces I wanna take a look at. I'm gonna hit end selection, it's gonna show me what the U and V values for those surfaces are. And as you can see, and as I'm sure you've run into if you've tried to run a flow line over all of this, um, some are running one direction, some are running the other direction. Uh, so before we start editing those, I want to show you the reflow because I want to get a, a good flow on one of these surfaces and then propagate those UVs to the other ones. So we'll back out of this for a second and we'll go ahead and we'll look at the reflow function. Now the reflow function works uh, in a couple of different ways. So we'll select reflow and I'll select the surface I want to reflow. I can do real basic stuff like simply plug in a re uh, rotation angle or grab the gnomon and just you know, start swinging that around uh, to adjust that. I can also base it off curves, off wireframe. So I'm going to go to my levels. I'm going to turn on a uh, wireframe that's bounding that surface. I'll select my surface. And then I'll go ahead and put me on a single entity. I'll chain. I'll bounce that one up twice. You're allowed up to four, so that's why I'm extending that one. I can zoom in here. There we go. And one more. There we go. That should do it. All right. You see that does a pretty nice job of doing that. You can see I'm getting a little bit of a wiggle up here because of that rad. So what I'd actually like to do, and what I prefer to do with this, although that was a pretty good flow, so go ahead and just use a couple of parallel lines or, or nearly parallel lines to, to flow that. So again, reflow UV, I'm going to select that surface, select those two, and there we go. Get a very, very, very nice flow. Now that one I want to keep, so I'm going to go ahead and green check to keep that. You want to notice when I do this, it's actually going to trim that surface a little bit. If I turn that on, it put it on a different level, but it actually trimmed that surface up a little bit for me. All right, now I want to go ahead and show how to propagate that to the other. 
Um, I do want to move that surface real quick. Bear with me. There we go. Okay, now we can see it better. Okay, so to edit the UV, again, I'm going to select these again, and we should see there's that really nice flow we created for that one. I'm going to use these functions here, and you can see I've got different surfaces selected, and I can select a surface. For example, I want to play with that one. You know, I can change the directions a little bit there. Kinds of fun stuff. But what I'd like to do is go ahead and use the Propagate button. That's the best button here. What that allows me to do, if I select Propagate, is to select a parent or what they call a seed surface. I'll go ahead and select the one we edited or the one we reflowed. And what that'll do is that'll basically extend or propagate that flow to the other surfaces, which makes creating flow line toolpaths a lot simpler if everything's going the right direction. Um, so sorry, we'll mix up with that, but it's a nice function. Very, very cool. Okay, one more toolpath to show you, and this is kind of the, the big one. This is one we're all very, very excited about. It is Mastercam's new 3 plus 2 automatic roughing toolpath. It's essentially an OptiRough that can do its own planular shifts. All right, uh, so I've got a part, I've got a stock model created. I'm gonna turn off a couple of things so I'm just back down to my basic part, although I don't need to, it's just making it easy for me. I'm gonna go up to my toolpath ribbon and in my multi-axis gallery is three plus two auto, which is a brand new toolpath. So let's go ahead and take a look. So I'm gonna fire up a three plus two auto. I think we have to come up with a, a better name for it or a shorter name. Uh, let's see, I've got my tool selected, 10 inch or a 10 millimeter bowl. Uh, I'm going to go down to my stock. I'm sorry, I'm going to go to my model geometry first, just like you would on an OptiRough. And I'm going to go ahead and select my machining geometry, and I'm just going to give the solid just a good triple click. There we go. Just make sure I got all the surfaces. Yep, looks okay. I'll go ahead and add a little bit of stock to leave. I'll just add half a millimeter, 0.5, and then 0.5 again there. Uh, let's give that that color. Uh, and then I want to go ahead and add some check surfaces or some avoidance geometry. And essentially there, I'm just going to actually use my entire fixture and vice assembly. So I'm just going to go ahead and window that. And that's what I want to avoid. And again, I'll just go ahead and put in a simple stock to leave value there for those. There we go. Okay, so going down to the stock page, I'm going to go ahead and tell it I want you to use my first stock model for that. So I am using stock on that. And then I'm going to go down to my cut pattern. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a dynamic or tricordial style. Uh, my constant depth step um, or number of slice. So there's my depth cut there. We'll go ahead and we'll, we'll drop that a little bit. I'll go ahead and drop that. Actually, we'll do, we'll do 20 millimeter. That's fine. I forget we're in metric, so 20 millimeters, okay. Uh, down on the bottom, I've got my step over, my maximum step over plus a desired step over. I'll go ahead and put my max step over there at, at six millimeters. Um, desired step over 4.8, so I'll be somewhere in there. That looks okay. Uh, while I'm setting a max depth step there, the one thing you know we know from OptiRough, one of the great things that makes it wonderful, is the step up routine. Now I still have that here. I go to my depth steps on this, and I can choose a constant depth step basically to fill in what they're calling intermediate slices now. We know them as um, step ups. And we'll go ahead and we'll do two, two millimeters there. Now I can go to my tool axis control. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create some planes. Now I can have it do it automatically. I can have it do it manually. Or in this case, I'm going to do a semi-automatic. And let me get rid of some of the ones that are hanging around in there. So I'm going to remove those two. Uh, I've already got one initially created from the toolpath, which is just a straight sort of top view. And I'm going to go ahead and right click here to start adding some planes. I'm going to select a tool plane to add to this. I get a pop up window that allows me to use, you know, uh, some of the basic planes. I can look at name planes. Uh, or in this particular case, I'm going to look for a solid face. Now, I don't have my solid turned on, so I do need to turn my part back on. And I'm just going to go ahead and pick, say, this face here. And if you remember this little field, I can adjust the XY 
of that if I want to, but the number one is usually okay. So there's one plane listed. I'm gonna right click again, I'm gonna add a second tool plane, but this one I'm gonna go ahead and add as a named plane or a listed plane, because I've already created it. And there are my listed or named planes. I'm gonna choose my undercut plane, just a plane I created for that. And we'll go ahead and add that in there as well. Now, below that, I've got a little field called a search angle increment. And what the search angle increment, increment does, which is difficult to say, is it basically slices that part sort of as a sphere. So it's looking for features or surfaces or anything it can pick up between those planes at that incremental value. So every 10 degrees, it's gonna look for something else to machine, sort of in a sphere. Now below that, I've got a max stock to leave value. And it's kind of a quirky thing, but the max stock to leave is actually a combination of my stock to leave value for my machining geometry as well as my cut tolerance value. Now those add up, if I add those together, to 0.6 millimeter. What I need to do for my tool axis control, my max stock to leave, is just make that number slightly bigger, in this case 0.7. And that's all I'm going to do. Uh, select geometry, define a couple of planes off the solid, set some basic step over, step down, and step up values, um, and what stock I want to leave. We'll go ahead and we'll generate this. Now I'm gonna bring, here we go. I'm gonna bring my multi-threading manager over so we can watch this process. And we'll see what kind of tool path we get at the end of this. Anytime. The multi-threading manager, also known as the coffee break monitor. Oh, it's gonna take a while, time for a coffee break. Here we go. All right, so we got our tool path, and it's, it's busy, and, and there's obviously a lot of things we could do to tighten that up as far as retracts and things, but the basics are there. If I compare what I have when I started, this is my first opening piece of stock, and applying that multi, I'm sorry, the three plus two rough to that model, this is what I end up with. So this is with a single tool path and really not dialing it in that much. Um, you know, if I were to go back in and, and tighten things up, it'd, it'd be a little bit more efficient, it might look a little nicer, but even just sort of just eyeballing it the first time through, um, that's what I get. And, you know, using traditional methods um, to having to take an opti rough and index it around, you know, I, I would still be working probably on the first one uh, at this point. So um, is it a very exciting new tool path? And just kind of like OptiRough, I'm really interested to see where people are going to go with this. Um, so yeah, so thank you very much, guys.